Urban Agriculture, Episode 15, Aerofarm. This is Urban Agriculture, Episode Number 15, recorded on April 16th, 2015. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and with me is Dixon Despommier. Hello Vincent. How are you doing Dixon? Doing great. We're on the road, aren't we? We are. First it's, time for urban agriculture. This is the road show. But we didn't go very far. No. We went to Newark, New Jersey. That's right. Which is less than an hour for each of us. Yep. We're both New Jerseyites. This is true. And we are at the headquarters, the farm. Can we call it a farm? You can call Co it Aero Farms. a research facility. It's also a production facility. <clears throat> and it's a well, production we'll find facility. Out. It's called Aero Farms. It is. You've been talking about it for a long time. I have. And we have two principals with us to tell us all about it today. So let's introduce them. Uh, on my right, Mark Oshima is the co-founder and chief marketing officer. Welcome to Urban Agriculture, Mark. Thank you. Thank you for having us. We're excited to be able to share what we're doing and uh, also be able to hear more about what you guys are doing as well in terms of championing the industry overall. We try. <laughs> Thanks for having us. We know you're busy. Yeah, but we, yeah definitely lot, lots of going on. We'll talk a little bit more about that. On, on my left, he is the chief science officer. I love hearing science, don't you, Dixon? <laughs> Ed Harwood, welcome yes. to Urban Ag. Good morning, Vincent. And uh, it's really always good to see my good friend Dixon Despommier. So, I, yeah. And so, Dixon, you know both of these gentlemen? I do. For many years? Well, not, not as many years for Mark as I do for Ed. Well, you know both of them. So you, would you say he's your friend? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> friend and, and... Still. <laughs> you know, the thing about Dixon is the more you work with him, the less he becomes your friend. Just kidding. Oh, oh. <laughs> you know. I, it's okay, Dixon. That's okay. You I, can edit that As I've out. told you, I don't edit. <laughs> it's definitely not correct. <laughs> but I love to give him hell. <laughs> I want, to, off my back. I want to start by asking you guys, uh, tell us a little bit about your education and the path that you took uh, to get here. Since you're a science guy, Ed, maybe we can start with you. Sure. Where are you from? Um, I grew up south of uh, Boston, Massachusetts, and have traveled uh, through the, the land-grant system since. So you got a little bit of the Boston accent left, right? Just a um, tiny bit? I tr really try hard to suppress <laughs> it. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I, uh, I got three degrees at Colorado State University, one in microbiology, one in, in animal science, uh, master's in animal science, and then went into the industry and had some entrepreneurial experiences uh, automating uh, dairy farms. And then a PhD at Wisconsin came after I made a, a bit of an error and uh, needed to learn a little bit more so that I would not make those kinds of errors again. What was the PhD in? Um, Dairy science. Okay. Uh, I like the microbiology part because I'm yes, a Yes, I know. Yes, you're, you're, you're a really biologist. So we could, uh, that's true. All three of us have. Yes, are right, you a yeah. microbiologist? I am a microbiologist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in a microbiology department. Yeah. It's a good combination, actually. So I, do you think viruses are microbes? No. <laughs> I'm in a microbiology department. I study viruses. They must be, right? I know. I know but it's not the first thing okay. that comes to your mind, right? I know. I know. <laughs> No, good to hear that. So dairy science, PhD in dairy science. I love Wisconsin. What a great place. Right. Yes, excellent. Good time there. there. And how did you um, end up here? Um, I, 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 Cornell was looking for someone to supervise their extension educators, and uh, they pestered me for a little while, and I came to... Um, Ithaca, New York, and my family loved the place. We still, I still live there. We we really enjoy the the forty square miles surrounded by reality, <laughs> and um, and um, and in the course of working at Cornell, uh, saw this type of technology, aer aeroponics, and wondered why it wasn't out in the in in the world and asked a lot of questions about it and was told that it was really just a research technology, not something for, for commercialization. And that was my, my role was to commercialize or help commercialize things through the extension education uh, system. So, um, but I, I didn't quite buy into that. So I've since then pretty much been motivated by the fact that 
many people tell you that this is not possible, that it will never be competitive, all those types of things. And uh, today we're able to tell you that <laughs> it works, uh, that it's economically uh, very good, okay, and that we can scale this up to a very large scale. At what point did you meet Dixon? Uh, we were both invited to, um, we made presentations. You talked first about how the world was about to hit the, hit the, 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 the wall, all right, in terms of food production, and then I followed up with uh, how the technology came together. Right. And I, it was, um, was, that an it was in New York City. Yeah, it was it was, I'm trying to remember the gentleman that put it together. Yeah, I, I forgot okay. too, but yeah. uh, they still meet so, once a month. Yeah, they do. Yeah, I get an invitation once in a while. Energy concerns about uh, fossil fuel use and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. So we were there to, to talk about the use of resources in a better way, in this case, water, and uh, even the energy for the lighting. Um, all of that combined together to say, here's the way farming is being done now, and here's the way we want to do it. And the energy concerns are so different for each of these two approaches that uh, if you don't see that this is a better way, then you're not, you're not paying attention. And, and they came away with that view as well. It was a good meeting, actually. It was a good meeting. But then we've met several times after that, too. Yes. In yeah. your own hometown. <laughs> In my own hometown. Yes, College Town Bagels. That's, <laughs> That's right. Exactly right. right. Exactly right. So, so I, I, I went to Cornell. <clears throat> And I remember driving back and forth, passing many dairy farms. Mm -hmm. I used to drive late at night, and I hoped I wouldn't run out of gas, and I would have to knock on the door of a dairy farmer, because I just thought they would be scary. You know? But it's a nice country up there. They would have offered you a glass of milk. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. Mark, uh, where are you from? Uh, I grew up in uh, New Jersey originally, so... You know, this is home, uh, being in Newark. I uh, grew up nearby in Morristown. You know, I was going to say Morristown. Why, why do I know that? I don't know it, accent. but a lot of people... Is accent. No, no, a, a, lot of people, accent. a lot of people are from Morristown. <laughs> are they? Yeah. yeah, it's actually a really small story, an unbelievable story, that my father worked for Prudential, which is just a block away from where we are today. Oh, wow. And so um, he worked here in Newark for, for many, many years yeah. to be able to be right here in his backyard. Uh, but also, we're working with Prudential today, so it's kind of neat how things can come full circle. Uh, but I went to college and, and business school at Columbia, so appreciate you know your backgrounds and what you guys are doing for the university. You didn't take my course, did you? I did not. No, no. It would be unusual for an MBA candidate to take a course in virology, but he was an undergraduate. <laughs> you weren't giving that course. Then. You what year did you graduate? Uh, 1991. It was undergrad, and so uh, going back a few years. And so yeah. I've been in the city since then. I live in Manhattan. Uh, my wife, uh, born and raised in Manhattan as well. She went to Columbia and then University of Pennsylvania uh, Law School. Uh, but Manhattan is home, and um, being here in the New York market is exciting for us in terms of being part of what we think is an opportunity to really pioneer a new way of, of farming. And by doing it right here so close to the, most, you know, to the biggest market is exciting from that standpoint. And how did you end up um, here? Doing this, so you have an MBA. Which I guess you can do anything with an MBA, right? How, how did you end up at this particular? I, I've had a passion around marketing uh, and thinking about, you know, how do you connect with the consumer? And so my career has been built on thinking about launching businesses, launching brands, uh, and thinking about the business model behind that. And so, uh, extensive background in, in retail and brand management specifically. Uh, and then specifically what's really uh, uh, applicable here is that I had, I had headed the marketing for the Food Emporium, a uh, supermarket chain here in the Northeast, sure. uh, as well as for Cirola uh, Markets, which is a, a line of specialty food gourmet markets, uh, one of the best in, in the U.S. as well. And so it's one thing to have technology, and we're, gonna hear, we're here to tell you a little bit more about the technology and celebrate it, but we're even here about uh, focus on the food and, and really what makes it so special in terms of the flavors, the varieties. Uh, we've been able to do some amazing tastings with all the top chefs, uh, top buyers, uh, and the feedback we get is just is, is astounding. So, from a marketing standpoint, we have we've got a great product and great technology to, to enable that. Can't beat that. It's a great combination. Yeah, yeah. Can you tell us a little about the history of how this company came to be? Yeah. Uh, how yeah. long ago did it get started? Yeah. Well, Ed can give you some of the early uh, first chapter. Sure. Uh, in 2004, I had left uh, Cornell and really put together something with the assistance of an engineer, Travis Martin. Um, so the two of us just kind of worked on this technology, came up with a prototype, grew uh, a, 
a single clamshell a week, you know, real small sample, took it around. People really liked what it was, so that was some positive reinforcement. So I, I sold in the Ithaca, Tompkins County, um, Cortland County area for uh, about four years, three and a half, four years. Um, and um, in, then in 2009, uh, a venture capitalist made an investment. We shifted the business model from me having a, a, a farm to, to making the equipment and merchandising the equipment. And in 2011, one of the prospects at the time uh, was David and Mark, and uh, it just seemed like it was a, a great merger uh, of the, the two companies. And so that was the genesis of Just Greens. And Mark and David, it, it, this would not be here without Mark and David's uh, work. Uh, when did the, I'm sorry, when did the Phillips Academy story come in? Uh, the Phillips Academy started around, I think it was 2010, uh, and it was a bit of a serendipitous uh, kind, kind of a thing. There, there was a group called the Eco Veggies. Uh, they were sitting in front of St. Phillips at an economic development, and the St. Phillips people were saying, we have these rooftop gardens, and it's really unfortunate. The kids get to see the planting, and then don't see the harvest or or there's a lot missing in between and wouldn't it be great if we had something in which they could see it all and these very astute gentlemen turned well, around and said Newark, we have right? something for you <laughs> yes this is in Newark okay. all right so we have something for you and uh that that kind of grew from there and it's been in the school uh the the kids love it the parents love it because the kids love it it's what, 50 feet or so from the salad bar? So, yeah, it's right uh, there. I mean, right. it's, it's, it's the closest I think you can get a farm to a, to a salad bar if you want to think of it that way. And uh, they've, in, they've very much enjoyed it. Um, it's, it's integrated to, into uh, classroom activities, it's integrated into the kitchen. So, uh, yeah. Just to build on one of the things Ed was sharing, though, in terms of that history, and, and Vincent, you know, having spent time up in the Finger Lakes area, uh, growing and being at the farmer's market. Ithaca Farmer's Market is one of the best you know, farmer's markets around. And then being side by side with those local farmers, field farmers, and having your product you know, stand up and, and exceed. And Ed had a lot of history and success there, as well as with top restaurants like Moosewood Restaurant, right? So you think about that high bar that Ed was able to set very early on, and that's really, really the basis of when we think about the product and how do we continue to think about optimizing that taste and texture, nutrition and yield. Uh, it's been core to what we think is differentiating long term here is around that product difference. What made you um, come to Newark? So we're in a building in Newark. I walked in the door and I was hit <laughs> by a wall of moisture and you could tell right away it's a, it's a farm. What made you come to Newark as opposed to staying up in the Finger Lakes or going somewhere else? Yeah, so this is fundamentally about how we can be able to be in the biggest market here in the U.S., right? And how we can have a showcase uh, for our technology, be able to have opportunity to be part of a community. Why Newark specifically? Um, Dixon just highlighted that we've been in the school, Phillips Academy Charter School, for over four years. So there's been a tremendous amount of goodwill within the community. Uh, also, uh, Ed had talked a little bit about our CEO, David Rosenberg. And just to give you a little bit of background, uh, he's been a clean tech champion, uh, very successful uh, entrepreneur. Uh, one of his prior companies started here in Newark. So also a lot of history within the city of Newark. And so we think about you know, where we want to be. Uh, there's also a component here about how we access and address issues around food deserts, right, and increasing access to healthier food options. How do we uh, address uh, higher rates of unemployment here? So when we think about where we can have the biggest impact and where we want to have our farms, it's fundamentally about how we can drive economic development. So it's talking about job creation and then healthier choices. So can you tell us a little bit about this building that we're in at the moment? Sure. So right now we are in our R&D farm that's uh, home to our corporate team. Uh, it's a former urban apparel store nightclub, right? And so we're really putting the urban and urban farming here. Uh, when you walk around, you, you can see a lot of the different uh, pr prior decor. Uh, but what this is fundamentally a story about and what our message is about is how we repurpose different spaces uh, and how do we make it fundamentally productive. Uh, we talked about our program at the school. Our technology is very modular. It can be adapted to different environments. And our focus right now, though, is on scale uh, and how do we commercialize this. And so right now we are also in the process here in, in Newark 
uh, building out what's going to be the world's largest indoor vertical farm for baby leafy greens. And so that will have the capacity of producing annually 2 million pounds, and that's significantly bigger uh, than anything else out, else out there. That won't be in this site. That will be somewhere else, right? That's just uh, two miles away in the ironbound section of Newark. And so ground is broken there. Uh, we'll be moving in later this year. Very exciting. Dixon, another trip to take someday, right? You betcha. No, I'd be glad to take that trip once a week just to see what's going on. Well, you could do yeah. that. Well, and pick up your greens, right? And so. pick up my greens, of course. <laughs> I would not go home empty-handed. Do you? When we came in, we can see multiple floors where your growing area is. Do you have the whole building or just part of it at this time? So uh, in this particular space here, uh, it's, it's one level plus the mezzanine. Uh, that is uh, where our team is. But what's neat about the mezzanine when you guys are walking on as well, you're able to walk around our growing machines and really see the multiple levels and, and seeing how what, and this is a key thing in terms of how we define vertical farming, right? So there's different ways. So some people have thought about a greenhouse on a rooftop or they thought about a skyscraper. Uh, here we're thinking about it's one story, but how many levels of growing can we get into that uh, particular area? And it's about productivity per cubic foot. And there's a reason why when we think about our business and how we drive the business, we focus specifically on short stem leafy greens so that we can get as many levels growing beds in that vertical space as possible. Uh, it's about focusing on a crop that has much faster crop cycles. So in our system, with that same seed that out in the field would be 30 to 45 days, and our system can be 12 to 16 days. What that means is up to 30 crop turns a year. And what that means then is, you know, versus that field, you know, two to three, we're talking about 75 times greater productivity per square foot than what you have out in the field. And oh, by the way, one of the major issues that we see every day in the headlines is around the water and drought issues. Our way of growing uses over 95% less water. <laughs> it uses less fertilizer and uses zero pesticides. So this is a new way of controlled agriculture that we think is really differentiating. Ed, can you tell us a little bit about the growing systems that you've put in place here? Sure. Um, the system is an aeroponic system, which means that the roots are, are sprayed uh, with a nutrient solution. In our case, it's a, called a closed system, which means we recycle uh, those nutrients. So as they're sprayed onto the roots, they drip then into a pan, it's sloped, uh, that runs back into the reservoir and then is repumped. That That gives us several advantages. We use up all the nutrients, so we're not uh, sending nutrients out to, to somewhere else where they're going to be more of a contaminant uh, means that we're sa uh, saving uh, water. Uh, the medium that we use to grow in is, is cloth. Uh, we reuse that cloth. We seed on it. There's no transplanting, so we put our seeds on there. They germinate and, and grow till they're harvested. Uh, and we have light on top of that, so uh, electric light uh, supplied by uh, through LEDs of a particular spectrum to to grow and give us the organoleptic, the the taste, the the color, the the crunch, all of those things uh, come as a result of sort of the whole system: the light, the nutrients, and the climate that how we provide. How do you? Figure out the taste and the crunch. Who does that? Everybody? You, you guys do it? Yeah, we do. Everybody, everybody in this room, and we'll give you that opportunity as well. Okay, but uh, yeah, and and it does taste. We're, we we have learned um, by doing the the experimentation that we have how to boost the flavor of things. Uh, to actually manage it. So uh, sometimes in the past, I've gone to a chef given them three different kinds of arugula with different pepperiness levels, and we're able to control that. And so then they can choose. Do you want something that's pretty mild, still looks like arugula and tastes like arugula, but may not be what you want, all the way up to something that's quite spicy? Yeah. So, I mean, we're looking at, you know, key influencers and tastemakers, you know, like the chefs, uh, working closely, you know, with the buyers. But even in-house, you know, the, the team that we've put together, um, I sh shared a little bit about my background on the retail and the food side, having done thousands of different food events, understanding what are the culinary trends. Uh, we've brought in-house, though, people who are trained uh, dietitians and nutritionists. I mean, have that expertise in-house is really critical when we think about what we can do with the product from both the flavor as well as nutrition standpoint. So the product you're making here, it's, it's testing. This is a research facility. Do you sell any of it yet, or are you just... Not this is strictly our R&D. But what you develop here, you'll move to your bigger facility, right? So what's great is everything that we're doing here is just transferable. So we have 10 years of history. We have our base recipes very much dialed in. It's constantly an exercise, though, of how we marry the biology plus the engineering. 
how we think about our CapEx and our design. We have a proprietary design, we have patents. Uh, one of the things that makes us unique with growing with aeroponics is our ability to grow with cloth. So gr growing, our growing medium is cloth, it's a reusable medium. So we actually, as Ed had highlighted, we seed germinate grow and, and harvest off that same medium, but it gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of the type of varieties. A lot of systems you're locked in, you can only do head lettuce or you can only have certain spacing. It's always about how you can drive yield and density, and so this kind of an approach gives us an opportunity to have uh, a very dynamic range. We've grown over hundreds you know, of different uh, types of varieties of leafy greens, and so we can be very responsive to the marketplace as, as changes so change. If, and if a chef comes to you and says, I need this in six weeks for a big event, yeah. you can do that for them? Yeah, so this is about just-in-time growing you know, with, with our different partners. Do you, um you plan to keep this facility after the production facility is open to continue to do research? I guess you'd love to, right? Yeah, there's a, there's a number of things that will continue from an R&D standpoint, no question. And so uh, this is critical in terms of uh, our ongoing learning and what we think is you know, points of differentiation. You know, every one of our harvests, we have over 10,000 data points. So how big a facility are you planning? It, it's a, a 40,000 square foot facility. As Mark said, it's in, in the iron bound, um, growing uh, close to 2 million pounds a year of baby leafy greens. So the listeners somewhere out there don't know what the iron bound means. They're like, you're trapped in iron or something? What is the iron bound section of Newark anyway? <laughs> I, I think it's a bit ironic in a sense that uh, we're, we're in the place where it once was a steel uh, mill, right? Sure, and, yeah. and the iron bound has a very interesting history that it's a uh, Portuguese community, right, Mark? So, yeah, yeah, largely uh, Portuguese. Yeah, and so it, it's... Uh, Taking this uh, former steel factory, uh, and when we were there, they were still doing um, steel work, uh, and repurposing it. It's you know how do you how do you make this productive? And uh, while the growing space is forty thousand, uh, we're also and this is what one of the key messages. It, it's this is hard to do from seed to package, right? And how do you do it in a way that, that you can scale? Uh, we have dedicated separate space for processing, right? So taking the harvesting and and the packaging. And so this is about how do we provide that control uh, all the way through from that seed to package. Uh, it's also gonna be home to our corporate headquarters. And so uh, the overall facility footprint is 70,000 square feet. It's wonderful. Well, I've seen some renderings online. It really looks beautiful, by the way. So I should add to your description of the Iron Band. Come on, you guys aren't telling us everything. It's restaurant row for Newark. It's where people go to eat before they go to the Prudential Center or to see the Devils or to see uh, the other team that used to be here in the place in Brooklyn, I forget their name. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly right. So, so you will you, clearly service these restaurants. Yeah, We'd yeah. Love so, to, right? so restaurants as well as retailers there. Uh, so there's a great you know food tradition, and, and, and uh, we're definitely excited to be part of that community. Um, we're definitely excited to be working with the Ironbound Community Center. Uh, when we think about one of our ethos, you know, we're a mission-driven organization, thinking about how do we fundamentally transform agriculture. Uh, build responsible farms throughout the world. Uh, but here, what we're thinking about is about job creation, economic development. Uh, so we already have you know, on our team people that we've been able to hire from the Ironbound Community Center. And this is about, again, job employment, year-round employment, uh, fair wages, benefits. And so this is uh, something we're excited to be part of. So this facility will be on one level, essentially, with multiple level racks, as we've seen. All the growing is on one level. It's, a, it's one story facility? So the corporate offices is actually split into two. But in terms of where the growing is and how we've defined that, it's about um, a vertical space of it's a 36-foot ceiling. And, and who will be able to buy your produce, mainly New Jersey, New York? Or is it going to go beyond that? Yeah, so we've had tremendous, we have excess interest already and demand for our capacity. So this is one of the tough problems. Uh, we've had great feedback, uh, lots of interest in terms of the local and how we serve the local community. Uh, one of the things that's been eye-opening for us, though, has been the response, again, to our product and the, and the quality of the product. Uh, we've had retailers say, we want to distribute this nationally. And that's been eye-opening to us in terms of, we've thought, obviously, local, fresh, that's a big part of the messaging. But when we can dial in so specifically on differences on that quality, the standpoint, um, our eyes are opened as well about the opportunities to quickly expand. And uh, we really want to highlight that our, our vision here is not just about a farm. It's about how we can really fundamentally change agriculture across, across the world. And so we actually have projects in development on four different continents you know, right now. And so 
it's an exciting time in terms of thinking about how quickly we can scale and address these unmet uh, demands. So you mentioned venture investment, you've mentioned Prudential. Are these companies excited about this new opportunity or is it just another investment to them? No, fundamentally, this is what's unique, first and foremost, about food, right? Food is personal. Everyone, you know, has a connection <laughs> with it, right? And we talk about, you know, serious issues around food deserts and access to healthy food. So how do you fundamentally change things within the urban footprint? I mean, this is a major impact from that standpoint. Uh, so everyone, and everyone is, has enjoyed the greens. That's where everyone has actually gotten a chance to seed and harvest as well and be hands-on. And so I think it's about this connection to the food, you know, like never yeah. before. I think that's really powerful. So your, your goal would be to move beyond this facility, get this one going, but you're also open to making others That's correct. throughout the country and around the world. That's correct. So we are in, in, in quick, uh, rapid expansion mode. So just to highlight one thing around, you know, you mentioned Prudential. Uh, we have venture capital that has supported us at corporate. We have project institutional uh, supporters with Goldman Sachs and, and Prudential uh, at, at a project level. And so there's a lot of, in terms of, uh, sophistication. These are difficult things to be able to pull together. Uh, they're complex, uh, but it speaks to how we've approached it from how we've built our overall team uh, and expertise on the team. And this is one of the things that, again, it's important in terms of thinking about how to go to market and how to build a business that can actually uh, have an economic uh, support behind it. So dining at Goldman Sachs executive dining room will be a different experience in another year from now, I presume, because that's, that's the real um, way to sell this is to just get it on their plate. It, it, it's amazing what happens when people try the product, right? Words, you know, that come out, and, and it's actually the simple words, you know, the feedback we get is that it tastes so clean, which is amazing because it speaks to this process, right, this controlled environment. But more importantly, it's like the essence of the flavors just come through. Uh, Ed has had this high bar that's, uh, you know, driving a lot of this no salad dressing, right? Uh, we actually did a slow food event tasting where, um, and I've done thousands of different food events. Never have I just put out greens on a plate and people come back and just grazing and saying you don't need to have any dressing. And so that's what we celebrate, exposing people you know, to amazing flavors and, and textures. That, uh, and this is what the retailer is excited about as well, is about driving overall consumption. How has Newark as a city responded to this? Yeah, and that, that's a big part of you know, why we're here in Newark. Uh, it started... Uh, first, uh, when Mayor Booker was here, uh, now with the current administration, they're big supporters of what we're doing. Uh, again, fundamentally, it's about economic development and how we can help change you know, that landscape. Uh, so they've had tremendous uh, excitement and interest uh, in, in terms of uh, helping support with us. Mm. Ha is this something you could also do in New York City, in Brooklyn, say? Would that make sense? This can be adapted into you know, a number of different areas. And so you have a couple of key, th key things to think about. Um, you know, it's about your labor force, it's around uh, your rent uh, and, and how you manage those costs. And so there's opportunities in, in every single uh, marketplace. You were going to ask something, Dix? No, I was just going to um, reiterate the fact that Newark has always been interested in this idea. About 2009, I wrote an op-ed piece for the Times, yeah. which I never expected to get published, but it was. <laughs> <laughs> and the second phone call I got, the first phone call I got was from o Obama's uh, cabinet members. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, it was just one person, uh, yeah. Adolfo Carrion, but he told me that everybody at the cabinet meeting that morning read this op-ed piece, and they were just stunned by yeah. the simplicity of the idea, obviously. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I sound like I'm taking credit for it, but I'm not. It actually arose in a classroom, as you know. So this is 10 years' worth of brainstorming with a bunch of very gifted people that had nothing to lose except, well, let's try to save the world, and this is how this idea actually came about. Yeah. And the other phone call I got was from Stefan Pryor, who yeah. was the deputy yes. mayor of Newark, yeah. and said, I, we want you to come over and show us how to do it. They didn't say, tell us what it is. They wanted me to show I said, you know, I, I talk about this, but I don't do it. You know, I, I talk the talk, but I haven't walked the walk. You guys are walking the walk. And I can't tell you what a reward that is for someone who's an academic, just like Vince, we sit and we watch these ideas grow, and we can't take credit for them because you guys actually did it. Yeah. So that, that's where this really, you can't have one without the other. Yeah. So yeah. the idea was there, sure, and Ed was working, and you were working in some way. And to see the perfect storm for these ideas to come together in a place like this is absolutely 
fabulous. So I, I, you know. You're lucky it worked, Dixon. We're damn lucky. We're I tell him all the time because in the early days, we have a colleague who, do with who is very skeptical. <laughs> oh, about they it. still are. And, uh, no, no, we've it, got lots of skeptics out there. I love them because <laughs> they're the ones that drive people to the next level. They drive you to say, see, I, you don't even have to say, see, I told you so. Here, taste this. <laughs> and that's the best thing. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, this is great. I mean, in the sense of, you know, how do you move an industry? How do you move, create change? You, you, you need that big vision, and, and you've been a big part of that. Uh, but here, it's, it's really the fundamentals, right? And so we have a, a team, uh, we mentioned our CEO, about you know, how do you build organizations? You know, how do you build cultures? How do you build uh, the processes to be able to drive a business, first and foremost? Uh, and then think about how do we marry this technology with a business plan, and then think about, again, how do we create the right sure. product offering. Sure, so sure. It's, a, it's a number of different things to put together. You know, if you could read my email, those are the questions that I'm getting now. Not, should I be doing this? It's, how can I do the business side of this now? Mm -hmm. And I just forward those emails to people like yourself and say, yeah, here, you answer it. <laughs> You've got those answers. Now, whether you're willing to share them or not, that's another question, but, but at least you can encourage young people to get involved in this at some baseline level. Yeah, well, fundamentally, too, it's just, you know, we know the changing face of, of the farmer, right, in terms of the aging traditional farmer. This is a way for people to, to be involved. Uh, Absolutely. And, and uh, make sure we have the right uh, yeah. interest and in, in yeah, involvement. Sure. One of my big questions in the classroom was uh, recently, what, what do you call children of successful farmers? And it was a dead silence, just like now. And I said, you call them doctors <laughs> and lawyers. <laughs> you don't call them farmers because they didn't go into farming. They saw what happened to their parents and how tough a life it was and how little profit there was and why it's at the whim of weather. It's, it's a crazy business. It's not a business. The old farmers, but the, the old new farmers, farmers that's right. their kids will say, that's just great. I'm exactly this, right, right, exactly right. <laughs> I mean, here you have predictability and you have control, whereas outdoors you don't have any of that. So that's, that's why it works. There, there's also a, um, an, a, the, the kids of today are very technologically astute, yep. and this appeals to them because this that's is right. much more technological right. than, right. than sort of being, as you were saying, Dixon, the, sure. at the whim of the weather, the climate, yeah, exactly. And, and that. Exactly. And we've been at the whim of the weather <laughs> and the climate for some time now, and it's taken us a while to wake up, right? So I want to find out what you guys do every day. Ed, you, you're a scientist. Yeah, Tell me what you do when you come in here in the morning. Uh, there's a number of projects, obviously, here to try and, and, and refine what we're doing. And so I work with uh, the, the, the individuals here who are working on those particular projects. Um, I also, because I've been doing this for 10 years, my, my, my lens, I guess, or on, on the product is, is a useful contribution. So I, I go around and see what I can learn just from, from what's happening and how to interpret that in a, in a, in a more scientific way. Okay, so you spend your days here in the facility. I, I'm down here most weeks for three to four days, um, yeah. Are you still living upstate? Yes. Ah, yes. You have to drive yeah, down still here. living in Ithaca. Are you having a blast? Yes. This is this is <laughs> like this is unbelievable in many ways. Okay, for someone to start out, put your resources in, be very small, have everybody tell you that it isn't going to work, including a whole bunch of professors. All right, <laughs> and and now to be here and and to have great partners, to have a great team uh, coming along, uh, a a research facility in which we can refine all of this. I, I, that's astounding. Right. Mark, how about you? You take the train from Manhattan, right? You walk here. What do you do when you come in the door? You get that blast of humid air. You probably like that, right? Well, yeah. So, you know, what it, what it, this is the perfect environment for the plants. And so, I mean, we like to think about creating the right environment where our plants thrive, but also our people. So this is about how we think about the right culture. And this is an exciting time in terms of the business. We're, we're, we're building the team. Uh, so the marketing that we're doing is very much about internal as much, as much external. Uh, every day is quite different, though. I mean, we think about our, our, our story and we think about um, our communication. Uh, we think about the product. Uh, the product at the end of the day is, 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 our, is our calling card. And so we invest and spend a lot of time thinking about what's that right uh, product mix, what's the right variety, what is the product spec and the quality you know, around that. Uh, we think about how we partner closely then, you know, with the community of retailers and, and uh, food service and thinking about those, cultivating those relationships. Uh, and then thinking about, again, the big strategy about we get constantly inquiries uh, about come to my market, come to my country. 
Uh, how do we prioritize those efforts uh, it is a big part, and you know we have a dedicated corporate development team now for this. This is to give you nice. a sense of like you know how the business is scaled. So you get lots of inquiries about helping others, right? Yeah, lots of inquiries and with lots of excitement. Uh, I shared with you this BioFuture article. Uh, right. You know, this is very much international. That's a French publication, but in terms of uh, we've done stuff with the BBC, we've done stuff, you know, just recently with Geo, um, you know, German publication. Uh, we had stuff on French TV One. Uh, this is resonating uh, on a global basis, and you know, uh, a lot of the travels uh, that I've been doing as well. I uh, just was in the UAE for the Global Forum for Innovation and Agriculture, uh, helping position what Aero Farms is doing as one of the thought leaders, and you know, again, building on that 10 years of history that we've had. We think we're in a unique spot to, uh, to really be able to expand more quickly now. So have you already developed your packaging for the product and, and yeah. all of that? It's done, ready yeah. to go? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, a lot, of, um, a lot of the creative and brand identity and brand expression and packaging development, uh, we're, we're ready. And so, you know, we're excited about the progress we're making on being able to be in the market later this year. And that's the biggest question we get from, you know, the retail right now is when, you know, when can I get it? And, uh, we, we know it's uh, just around the corner. So this this facility, the new, the production facility, is under construction at the moment. Uh, yep, construction. Has, and what, has what's started. your prediction for production time? When is it going to start? Well, it's um, third quarter, so we're moving in in September. Um, we're pre estimating that we'll be growing uh, in, by November, just in terms of that build out. 2015. Of 2015. Yeah. Wow. So when we say it's around Fast. the corner, it's 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 nice. here. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So I, I, I'm curious as to your long-term uh, vision for this burgeoning industry. Okay, so I, I'm going to ask you a, a long-term question now. So and I'll, I'll preface it by saying the pharmaceutical industry of the world started in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. We know this. And it started with a specific product, streptomycin. We know that too. And we also know who did that work. <laughs> and it resulted in a, an enormous institute established at the State University at Rutgers. Um, but that pharmaceutical industry, even though streptomycin was their dominant product, realized very early on that if you only sell streptomycin, well, then they'll have to go to this industry for that one and this industry for that. And, but while streptomycin makes all the money and these others don't, in order to keep them as customers, they offered a bunch of other antibiotics and other products, to, biomedical products, which didn't make too much money for them, but which kept the customers keep, keep coming in. So that's the model that I'm thinking about for indoor farming. You start with leafy greens to get everybody interested in the products, and you've obviously got customers all around you that are just dying to get this product. But they're going to start to ask you other questions, as they have me, I know. When are we going to get rice? When are we going to get potatoes? When are we going to get rutabaga? When are we going to get, when are we going to get all those other things that we all want, that if they taste as good as your leafy greens, we will be your customer for life. Yeah. Have you got a, an, an image of where you see yourself 10 years from now, after you've been very successful with what you're doing? Do you think you ever might get involved in a, a wider range of products? Yeah, so this, this concept of diversification, you know, as well as thinking about, you know, how do you secure a customer and, and manage that relationship is something we think about all the time. Uh, we think right now the core focus is about the expertise on these short stem leafy greens, right? And that's really how we've optimized our technology, how we've optimized, you know, our, our growing algorithms and thinking about that product offering. Uh, but no question that this kind of controlled growing has other applications, whether it's within the food and, and other crops, and we can think of this some definitely applications um, and even industries you mentioned the pharmaceutical there's been lots of interest of having product that's clean and grown in a pristine environment that can be used and adapted from extraction standpoint um, cosmeceutical nutraceutical so there's lots of different applications but we really want to highlight that our focus is on leafy greens and that's where we're, we're going to be uh, you know I think spending our time great thank you but clearly there's a need to move into other there is. Right, I mean, I can right. share is, with you the anecdote of just having gone down to College Station, Texas, yep. to visit with a company down there that's got an 18-story building, and they've just got one crop inside, of course, but in that plant, they're growing the vaccine for influenza, mm -hmm. or factor nine for curing hemophilia or something like this. So, yep. so yep. I'm sure these ideas are all part of the same schema, and eventually you'll have a merging of technologies that will yep. you know, be robust and long-term. Yeah. I think what's critical for us right now is we've talked about, you know, 
the business and the business model, right? The economics. And so we want to be really good, you know, and we want to really understand, you know, what the unit economics are and, and be able to deliver on that. And that's, that's what's critical here. Terrific. It makes sense because oh, you have to prove that it works. And you if you, leafy greens work, sure. use this. but your vision of replacing farmland will not be complete until you do other things, exactly. right? Potatoes, exactly. strawberries, cows, wheat, rice, sheep, pigs. <laughs> Ooh, I wouldn't go there yet. <laughs> they actually don't take up much land, but they use a lot of food to feed those people. If you go to Japan, for instance, and you see what they're doing over there now, because they had to, as the result of the earthquake and the Fukushima event, you can now go to grocery stores and slide the cabinet back and pick a crop and take it up and pay for it and take it home and eat it sure. within 20 minutes of the fact that you've just seen that. So yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm certain that these models are aware, you're aware of all of them yep. and you're going to take full advantage once you're up and running. Yeah. And, and it goes back to when you see different uh, installations like that, it, it goes back to a couple of things that we hold pretty sacred. One is around food safety, right? So, you know, how do you ensure that in, in those kind of applications that you're talking about? Uh, and so this is about control from the seed to package, and uh, we think that's really a, at a premium. Uh, the second part, though, is um, about the yield, right, the productivity of that. And so, you know, I think as a novelty, as a showcase, it can be meaningful. Um, but in terms of when we think about how to drive a business and, and the economics behind it, there's a different level of commercial aspect. No there. question. So I, I walked into this facility unimpeded you know one of your guys opened the door and I walked in but in your production facility I presume you're going to have some safeguards to prevent people from coming in and bringing in crop pests and so forth. absolutely right? absolutely so again we knew you were coming so that was part of that lens we do have a video camera right at the door just so you know uh, <laughs> I saw it <laughs> we actually send out a search party for you but that's another story <laughs> But in terms of, yeah, no question, is, that's part of that. Um, there's a very uh, elaborate uh, standard operating procedure in terms of in protocol. And so we put that, at a, again, at a very high premium. And so all those will be in place. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Terrific. What's, what's interesting about the whole system is it observes the lessons that were learned from integrated pest management. So there's a lot of barriers uh, built into this uh, subtle ones uh, to keep pests out and should pests figure out how to, how to make this happen, how they get removed very rapidly as a result of the normal operation of, of the system. Wonderful. It, one thing to highlight in, in Ed's background too on the dairy sciences, and, and by the way, he, he minored in artificial intelligence too. He's too modest to highlight that. But I mean, this is one of the out-of-box thinkers, right? I mean, artificial intelligence I 30 years ago. That. 30 years ago, yeah, yeah. So, um, but everything from a sanitary standpoint, uh, design, practices, has come from the dairy industry in terms of what's needed from a hygiene. Yeah. So all of that thoughtfulness that Ed has been able to uh, experience firsthand has been incorporated into you know, how we think about operating. So it's really important. Dixon, anything else? Well, um, not now, but of course, when they uh, get ready to open, <clears throat> I was going to ask something about an educational component to your operation and maybe some visitor centers or a business advice center or whatever that you would use as a way of uh, cloning yourselves and making people go out and saying, wow, we want to do this too. Um, have you got any thoughts about that? So to highlight, you know, we, we've talked about uh, the successful school program we've had for over four years. We constantly look at, you know, our, what are ways we can extend, you know, programs like that, have an impact in the community. Uh, we have built into the corporate office, though, in the space, uh, a multi-use space for education tours. Uh, we've had retailers say they want to bring their produce, you know, team there for, for training. So it's uh, it's part of the equation in terms of how we help advance the industry from an education standpoint. That's great. Yeah, I think Newark is really going to be pleased with what you have to offer them. And uh... well, it, it goes both ways. They, they've they've welcomed us, and there's been, as I mentioned, a lot of goodwill, and uh, we think there's great collaboration here. Outstanding. You were talking about other crops. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that's really fascinating here is we, we currently, if you go into a grocery store, there's a limited offering in terms of, of the number of varieties that are presented. And given, as Mark said, we've, we've 
grown several hundred different varieties, and when you do that, you get to see the considerable difference. So that high bar of no dressing can be met with just the, the leafy greens, and so instead of having the waitress ask you what you want on top, they should be asking you what do they want on the bottom. <laughs> good. Very good. That's great. Excellent. Is there anything else that you'd like to send out to our listeners that we haven't touched on, uh, Mark or Ed? Uh, you know, listen, I mean, fundamentally we're excited to to be here and helping advance the industry that, you know, you guys have been helping support and champion. Uh, I think it goes back to understanding what are the economics and the business behind that, and that's uh, critical. And I think, you know, that's what we've been focused on, you know, day in, day out. Dixon, you're okay? Fine. How many, I meant to ask you, how many people are you planning on employing in the, your, your home factory? There'll be 70 people. 70. Yeah. Wow. You, got, you need a job, Dixon? Maybe. <laughs> he he, he was offering to set up a cot earlier, so. <laughs> well, we, we, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we do encourage people to, um, to reach out to us, uh, send a cover letter, send a resume if interested in joining us, uh, as well as different partners. I mean, again, this is, the goal here is to bring this farm near to where you are soon. Sure. So I'm, I'm still teaching, even though I'm retired at Columbia, I still teach at Fordham a little bit, and I've had students there ask about the possibility for interns, and internships, and, and I've told them about you, and I've told them about some other uh, vertical farms as well, so I would very much love to connect them up with you and, and yeah, see how Yeah, feel free to, uh, to forward them, and you know, we've had uh, quite a bit of interest, so we have to balance nice. in terms of um, sure. some of the considerations there, but what's exciting is, is you know, th- there's a lot to do and a lot ahead of us. So we'll tell them to go to aerofarms.com, yep. right, to find yep. out more. Are you guys on all the social media, I presume? You're on Twitter and Facebook? No? We have the, the Twitter and LinkedIn and stuff like that, but no, we have not done the Facebook. So you should know, do it. Get yeah. a lot of people on Facebook. I've heard, of, I've heard about it. Almost a billion. <laughs> Mark, you're a man after my own heart. <laughs> I get flack from him all the time about that. It works. It works. It's almost a billion people on Facebook. I'm and, on Facebook. You know, they're there for their family and friends. Sure. So you go in. I use science communication on Facebook. You can do your, yours as well. And you will get all those people who are there to see their cousins and they'll say oh look at this it really works it's very good i highly recommend it well we've been talking with two principals from aero farms today mark oshima thanks so much thank for you joining us today and ed harwood thank you professor thank you thank <laughs> it's you been a much. pleasure um, dixon de palmier thank you my pleasure are you, you going are. to work after this dixon i'm gonna go work up at the farm come on let's go upstairs to the, the farm, farm. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> uh, this is urban agriculture you can find us at urbanag.com WS. You can also find us on iTunes and all your favorite pod catchers will get it as well. And you have questions or comments, send them to urbanag at urbanag.ws. And if you have questions about uh, Aero Farms, send them to us. We'll, we'll forward them uh, to Mark and, and Ed. Uh, I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. The music you hear on urban agriculture is performed by John Harrison with the Wichita State University Chamber Players and Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. You've been listening to Urban Agriculture. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Hey, Dixon. Yeah, Vincent. I'll see you upstairs at the vertical farm. Absolutely. (laughs)